Good morning, everyone. I'm Philip Lyons, the Dean of the College of Criminal Justice and Director of the Criminal Justice Center. I'd like to welcome you to the presentation this morning, 23-7, Pelican Bay Prison and the Rise of Long-Term Solitary Confinement by Karamet Ryder. Karamet's an assistant professor in the Department of Criminology, Law, and Society at the School of Law at the University of California at Irvine. She studies prisons, prisoners' rights, and the impact of prison and punishment policy on individuals, communities, and legal systems. She uses a variety of methods in her work, including interviewing, archival and legal analysis, and quantitative data analysis, in order to understand both the history and impact of criminal justice policies, from medical experimentation on prisoners and record clearing programs, to the use of long-term solitary confinement in the United States. She holds a PhD in jurisprudence with an emphasis in history and crime and punishment, and a Juris Doctorate, both from the University of California at Berkeley. With that, Dr. Ryder. All right, can everybody hear me? I'm gonna come closer, because I feel like there's a football field. You know, first of all, thank you so much for coming out to listen to me at 9 a.m. the morning after the Super Bowl, which I understand was an exciting game. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, so how many of you have heard about long-term solitary confinement? School criminal justice, I'm guessing. Okay, good. So I'm gonna tell you a little about, my book focuses on California, and one of the arguments I make is that California built one of the first of these really modern long-term solitary confinement facilities. So I'm gonna tell you a little about California, but it really is quite similar to what happens in a lot of other states. I was lucky enough to be on a panel with a few Texans last week in Austin, so it was nice to be validated. There's a lot of similarities. I'll try to bring some of them up as I talk. So I'll give you a little background, and then I'm gonna talk about some of the things that surprised me in the course of doing the research about the history of long-term solitary confinement in the US as a way to kind of get at some of the more interesting, I think, arguments in the book. And I think there'll be plenty of time for questions afterwards, but I'm really happy to be interrupted if I say something that you uh, are confused by or want more information about. So let me start by just telling you a little about the conditions in these facilities. See if I can make this thing work. All right, so there, can you guys see those kind of? They're way back there vibrating a little. <laughs> so that's a picture of California's uh, security housing unit, which is like administrative segregation in Texas. It's a journalist's photo and a prisoner's drawing of the cell uh, in Pelican Bay Prison, which is California's main supermax, where people are in long-term solitary. Uh, and it's, that's an eight by 10 cell, it's poured concrete, the lights are on all day, every day, 24 hours a day. There's no natural light. Prisoners look out at a blank white wall through a perforated steel door. Uh, and there's a toilet sink combination there you can kind of see in the corner. So the prisoners really only need to leave that cell a couple times a week to shower or to go out into an outdoor exercise yard. They describe that yard as being like at the bottom of an emptied out swimming pool. It's a, it's just has a little bit of natural light. So prisoners spend not months but years at a time in these conditions of confinement in California. And they talk about going years without seeing the moon, another living, without seeing an animal, like it's really exciting if a bird happens to fly over that skylight when they're out in the exercise yard. And they generally have no human touch. So the only contact, physical contact they would have is if they're handcuffed because they need to go to the doctor or the law library. If you saw those cages on the cover, those are where prisoners would be held if they were in the law library or if they were waiting to see a doctor. If their family is able to come visit them, which the prisons in California are way more rural. There are no colleges in the middle of prison towns the way Sam Houston is. Um, at Pelican Bay is a good seven hour drive from San Francisco, 10, 11 hours from Los Angeles. So it's very hard for family members to get up there. But if they do, they would visit behind bulletproof glass. So it gives you this sense of the harshness of the conditions. And just to show you how these cells fit together. They're grouped together into these pods of eight, four on the bottom, four on the top. So this is what modern supermaxes look like. I think there may be a unit like this somewhere in the area. Anyone know? Something that looks a little like this segregation unit, Estelle? I, anyway, I'm trying to get my local area prison straight. But um, so, so four cells on the bottom, four on the top. Those prisoners look out at a blank white wall. And an officer in a central control booth looks out over multiple pods of cells at a time. So one officer looks out over six of these pods. So it's a kind of classic panopticon. He can press one button, open one door at a time, and they never actually even have to go on to these units to let a prisoner out into the shower or out into an exercise yard. That gives you a sense of the conditions. Now the question is how people end up here. And this is the really important part of the story is that prisoners don't get sent here because of what they did outside of prison. They're not being sent here by judges or juries. It's not a part of their criminal sentence. They're being sent here based on their in-prison behavior. 
So sometimes prisoners get sent into administrative segregation because they broke a rule or, or into solitary confinement or security housing. So they had contraband or they participated in a riot or they got in a fight and they get sent there for a fixed period of time. But in most states, prisoners end up in these conditions for really long periods of time because they're sent there based on their status. They're labeled dangerous somehow. And in California, the way that was done was prisoners were labeled as dangerous gang members. It happens differently in states, but this is kind of, there's some kind of superficial administrative process by which this happens. California's was especially superficial. Basically, anything that you might think of as a classic First Amendment right could get you sent into isolation at a place like Pelican Bay indefinitely. So this slide, if you can see it, is an example of the kinds of things that would get you sent to isolation in California. Up until some reforms last year, it took only three pieces of evidence and things like the tattoos on your body, so there's a picture of a swastika tattoo, um, but it could be you know, anything that might be associated with a gang. The things you were drawing, so that drawing I have up there is, is supposed to look like a Mexican mandala, it would be evidence of Mexican mafia membership in California or even things you were reading. So the autobiography of Malcolm X, George Jackson's letters could be one piece of evidence that would suggest that you were a member of the black gorilla family or the Black Panthers and get you sent to isolation. So I had been doing criminal justice work and prison work in California for a number of years when I started graduate school and I was really interested in why in the world the state developed these kinds of policies. I should tell you, Pelican Bay has 1,056 long-term isolation beds, those cells I showed you. And it turns out that a few years ago there was some data released. There were more than 500 people who had been at Pelican Bay for more than 10 years. Pelican Bay was built in 1989, and as someone interested in prisons and criminal justice history, I wanted to know why in the world California thought it was such a good idea to build this many long-term isolation beds with this kind of discretion over the conditions of confinement and the way people were held there. And so I started looking into the history, and I knew that Pelican Bay was one of the first of these big facilities. 1989, a lot of states built uh, facilities, supermaxes like this, or modern administrative segregation units over the course of the 80s and 90s. But Pelican Bay is sort of known as an iconic one. Have people heard of Pelican Bay, Texas? Okay, good, some of you, good. <laughs> so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not making this up that it's kind of iconic. It's been, it's been on 60 Minutes and news stories. So I started to look into the history of how this institution came about. And as someone who studies criminal justice and incarceration, I thought that it made sense, 1989, what's happening in the 80s, what are you thinking of? Criminal justice students, I hear some muttering. Mass incarceration, right? In, in the 1980s and 1990s, California built 23 new prisons. I think Texas underwent similar, they were under a lot of pressure for overcrowding, they added a lot of new prison beds in these years also. So I expected that supermaxes would be part of mass incarceration. That there would be this story about, yes, while we're building new prisons, we built supermaxes. But it turned out that as I dug deeper into the history of these institutions, I had to go way back before the 1980s to understand why people thought they were necessary. So this is a picture of George Jackson and then the aftermath of the revolt at Attica. These things happened two weeks apart in 1971 on opposite coasts of the country, California, New York. Who's heard of George Jackson? I'm always horrified by this. As a, and the historian in me is upset by how forgotten George Jackson is. So George Jackson, it turns out, is a really important part of the story of why California decided to build a supermax and, and is similar to many other stories in many other states. George Jackson was an African-American prisoner, went to prison in California in 1960 for a minor holdup of a gas station in which he stole about $50. Uh, and in prison, he became quite radicalized. Uh, and he wrote a book of best-selling letters uh, that was got national and international acclaim. They were letters to his lawyers, to his family, about the fact that he thought the criminal justice system was unfair. He was serving an indeterminate sentence of one year to life for this very minor crime. And by the time his book of letters came out in the 1970s, he'd been in prison for 10 years and had very little hope of getting out. And one of the arguments was that these indeterminate sentences where prisoners had to prove they were rehabilitated had grossly disproportionate impacts on African Americans like George Jackson. So George Jackson is writing and advocating. He's becoming kind of a problem for the California prison system. And in 1970, he gets accused of murdering a prison guard in Soledad Prison. If you've heard of the Soledad Brothers, that was the, the group accused of this. Um, and he's sent preemptively to isolation on death row at San Quentin State Prison, California's death row. And while there, 
in August of 1971, his lawyer comes in to visit him. And the story that prison officials tell is that his lawyer brings in a nine millimeter gun, it's a handgun like this, in a tape recorder. Now tape recorders were big in the 1980s. I'm not sure they were quite big enough to stash a handgun. That's the story that, that people tell. And that George Jackson then was able to use that gun to escape from this secure isolation unit on death row and run out onto the prison yard in California where he was shot dead by guards in the, in the control towers. And when the guards went back into his cell, they found that three officers and two prisoners had been stabbed to death. The gun that was allegedly smuggled in was never found, but this was the deadliest day in California prison history. There were six total deaths. Um, there's still a marker of this moment um, at San Quentin. There's a flag that flies at half mast. And two weeks later, in part in response to this, the revolt at Attica happened. So when prison officials talk about long-term solitary confinement and supermaxes, they point to these moments in their state prison systems as incredibly important moments of terror and violence when they were afraid that the prison system was completely out of control and they needed tools to get the control back. So this is a prison official who was working um, in the California prisons at the time, George Jackson, and later worked on the design of Pelican Bay. Uh, describing how there was, a, there was a civil rights movement outside of prison, but there was a violent revolution inside of prison that prison officials were genuinely scared of. So this was a thing that really surprised me about the story, both that I had to go back to the 1970s and that I had to come to understand that even though people tell this very contested discretionary story about what actually happened to George Jackson, that there was a genuine fear that people working in the system experienced in the 70s and continue to talk about and experience today and that that's part of the echo that drives this long-term solitary confinement. So it's an, it was a piece that surprised me both in terms of going back and, and understanding the fear that people experience from these stories. So that was the first surprise. I promise they're not all that long, but I find the George Jackson story interesting. Um, Oh, and this is just a chart to show you that the 1970s in California prisons, that spike there is in the early 1970s, were incredibly violent times in the California prison system. It is to say that this, there's no question that there was a lot of, um, the black line is murders of prisoners and the gray line is murders of prison staff and even suicides were high in those years. But what's important about this is that by 1989, when Pelican Bay opens, the violence in the prison system has completely stabilized. It's been falling for years, and it's quite low, and it continues to be quite low in California prisons, at least. Um, so it, it's to say that this story of George Jackson has this incredible resonance that holds for decades, even though violence in the system does go down over time. Okay. Second thing that's, oh, oh that surprised me about this story is that when I think of major punishment innovations, I often think of federal level things, like federal sentencing guidelines, like all the conversations now about immigration policy. Think of a lot of major things happening at the, or in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. But one of the things that's really interesting about supermaxes is that they actually started at a very local level. So it turns out the first supermax was built in Arizona in 1986. It's called the Security Management Unit. And when prison officials in California were building those 23 new prisons in the 80s, they toured all around the US looking for new models of prisons. And they described finding that, that supermax in Arizona and being really excited about it and deciding to build a bigger, better one in California in 1989 in the form of Pelican Bay. And then the federal government, when they built ADX, the, the, federal, the federal supermax facility where the Unabomber is, they actually also looked to California and Arizona for models of that institution. Uh, and so you can see there in that picture, the inside of ADX even has the same colors as Pelican Bay, the dark red uh, accents. Um, so there's a lot of echoes here where the local and the federal government are very much in conversation and not everything is happening as a top-down federal innovation. So at a time when people are potentially critical of some federal government policies, I think it's really interesting to remember how much criminal justice policy happens at an incredibly local level and how much of that then can trickle up, actually. I was just reading a story today about how California's attorney general has a lot of enforcement powers similar to the federal attorney general, and there's a question about whether other states will pass similar laws to give attorney generals enforcement powers around things like uh, patterns and practice of uh, illegal policing practices or patterns and practices in prisons. So it's another example of this power of the local to kind of actually trickle up counterintuitively. Okay, next thing that surprised me about supermaxes was that as a resident of California, I thought I would find a big public debate about building Pelican Bay in 1989. Because in California, we vote on 
everything about the criminal justice system. In the last elections, we voted about whether to have a death penalty. We voted about the sentencing guidelines for three felonies. We voted about what kinds of punishments there should be for people who traffic humans. So there's this incredible investment in California. We All these laws just go before the public and people vote on them every two years in elections. And in fact, when the state was building prisons early in the 1980s, the public was even voting on bonds to fund those prisons. So there was a lot of involvement in the process, and I expected I would find this heated debate in the 1980s about the ballot proposition that funded something like that 1,056-bed isolation unit in California. Same in Arizona. They have a proposition system. They funded this early 80s supermax. But it turned out that I found no ballot proposition and in fact, virtually nothing in the legislative archives about the decision to build Pelican Bay, which was especially surprising. So you may not think you're not gonna be able to see this. I love this little snippet from the archives. It is the only thing I found specifically referencing Pelican Bay in the California archives. And it's a, it's a transcript of the conference committee, so a subcommittee that's involved in prison building, talking about the institution. And they're debating whether to call it Slammer by the Sea, Casa no Pasa, Dungeness Dungeon. So they're having this incredibly flippant conversation about what to call this incredibly expensive, long-term, massive, solitary confinement facility they're building, but nothing about the details of the institution, what it's gonna look like, who's gonna be housed there, how much it's gonna cost to run. And it turns out in my research I found that by the late 1980s, the, the prison building process in California had essentially been privatized. They were no longer using public bonds. They were going to corporations and using a process called lease revenue bonds to privatize the, the process for funding prisons. And prison officials were in control of the design. And the legislator was basically just rubber stamping the uh, prison design that, that prison officials uh, put before them. So I think I have, I have some quotes from two prison officials, one who was head of finance and one who was head of construction. That's Carl Larson who was also talking about the, the impact of George Jackson over time. So he worked in the prisons when Jackson was there in the 70s and then he worked his way up to become head of construction in the 80s. He's the one who toured around, was so excited to find that supermax in Arizona. And he describes how he and other people working within the State Department of Corrections were really the ones who had control over these prison design and building decisions. So it's interesting to think about the continuity from the kind of discretion that uh, uh, governs a story like George Jackson, where we don't really know, was there a gun? What was he trying to do? Was he trying to escape from the prison? Was he being set up because he was dangerous? To this institution that's built with all this discretion, with very little public oversight, to the discretion about who goes there in the end. So this is one of the major arcs of the story is the, the lack of oversight and rules governing how these facilities are operating. Pelican Bay was in fact so hidden way up on, it's on California's northern border with Oregon, right on the coastline, that prison, that, that lawyers in the state who'd been litigating prison conditions issues for years and judges who had been overseeing prison litigation didn't know it had been built until they started receiving letters from prisoners there saying, can this possibly be constitutional? Uh, so the, there was a judge in California who had overseen litigation around George Jackson's case about the conditions in these old solitary confinement units on death row. There were lawyers who litigated those cases. None of them even knew this place had been built. And it did immediately raise a question of constitutionality. Um, there's this famous case from the 1890s that constantly gets quoted when people talk about solitary confinement in which the Supreme Court in an aside basically said, we don't do that anymore. We've abandoned solitary confinement. We had solitary confinement in the earliest US penitentiaries, but there was this kind of sense that as a long-term thing, it wasn't something we as a prison system did anymore. And yet part of the story of my book is that it's been in kind of continuous use in different ways under different names over time. And when Pelican Bay opens, there's suddenly this attention to whether this kind of institutionalization of this policy in this place where people are designed to be sent. You know, once you get up to Pelican Bay, it's hard to, it's hard to even get the bus to get someone out of there. So the idea is we're really kind of sending people there and, and forgetting about them. Um, and there are immediately, it's not just those harsh conditions, the lights that are on 24 hours a day, the fact that people are there without a, a sense of when they're gonna get out, there were immediately allegations of horrible abuse at the prison. There was an, the, the medical health care was, was, was never properly staffed at the beginning. Prisoners were being set up to fight each other, so even though they were supposed to have no contact, um, two cell doors at a time were being opened and prisoners from rival gangs were being let out onto the hallway to fight each other. Um, and there were horrible stories of prisoners, of uh, officers beating up prisoners. 
And these kind of started to trickle out. And there was a major class action case about uh, whether these conditions of confinement were constitutional or not. And there was, right at the time of the trial, so Pelican Bay opened in 89, this case, Madrid v. Gomez, the trial was in the early 90s, so right away, and the decision was in 95. Right before the trial started, 60 Minutes went up and did an expose of Pelican Bay. Um, one of the stories that really got the media attention was that there was an African-American prisoner there who was seriously mentally ill before he went into isolation. And there's a uh, disturbing relationship between isolation and mental illness. It turns out that mentally ill prisoners tend to have trouble following rules in prisons and can end up in isolation. And then there's good evidence that isolation can have a really detrimental mental health impact on people. Um, so this seriously mentally ill prisoner, uh, he's African American, he gets sent to isolation at Pelican Bay, and he smears himself all over in his own excrement. It turns out this is fairly common uh, in isolation units, and people argue about, is this, is this about mental health problems? Is this a way to control your environment when you feel like you have no other tools of control? It's not entirely clear, but it turns out it's disturbingly common. And we've got this, California has this brand new isolation unit. They've got this guy in the most restrictive, worst conditions of confinement they possibly can, and he's out of control, and there's kind of nothing else for them to do with him. And at least for the other seven guys on that pot of eight cells, and you can imagine for officers dealing with it, it smells horrible, this is a very stressful situation. And so the prison staff drag him out of the cell and dip him in a scalding hot water bath in an attempt to clean him. But they hold him down until more than half of his skin peels off. He survived, and he was one of the people profiled on this 60 Minutes story, and he became one of the kind of narratives that, that led to a lot of changes around the, the conditions at Pelican Bay in the sense that they needed better mental health care and medical health care. But there remained this fundamental question of whether Pelican Bay was constitutional, whether if we fixed all those problems, we got better health care, we trained the officers, we didn't have people beating each other up, whether we could put people in these conditions indefinitely. And one of the things that I argue in the book that's really interesting about Pelican Bay is that it turns out it looks much better than what came before. When George Jackson escaped from that solitary confinement unit at San Quentin from, from death row, that place had been condemned for being dirty, no running water, not good temperature control, uh, all kinds of problems with the infrastructure and it looking old. Kind of like the dark dungeons maybe we imagine when we think of early solitary confinement in the US. And it turned out that over the course of the 60s and 70s in the US, there was all this litigation about prison conditions. Ruiz v. Estelle in Texas, right, should, should ring a bell. That was happening all over the US. And courts were ordering better conditions, especially in solitary confinement. That was an issue in almost every case, that you needed to make sure that people weren't being stuffed into isolation cells and locked in, so there had to be a minimum amount of space, running water, adequate lighting. Turns out Pelican Bay is fairly responsive to a lot of that litigation. The lights are on 24 hours a day, it's made of this poured concrete, it's really easy to hose down and clean up when you have a problem with a prisoner like Von Dorch who smeared himself in excrement. Um, there's running water in the cell, it's incredibly technologically advanced and modern, right? One computer button and you can open a door one at a time. Um, so it, it turned out to be really hard for courts to find that these institutions themselves were unconstitutional once they were being well run. And so in the end, um, Judge Henderson, who's one of the most liberal judges in the US, he's a federal court judge, he's kind of like Judge William Wayne Justice, I think, of, he's, the, he's the Judge Justice of California. Uh, he just retired, he's overseen all kinds of prison litigation and other civil rights litigation in the state. He heard this case about Pelican Bay, and he said seriously mentally ill prisoners like Von Dorch cannot be sent there. And he said that the prison staff had to be trained better, and they had to have better medical and mental health care. And this led to years of litigation around medical and mental health care throughout the California state prisons. But he said that overall, it was OK to put people there indefinitely into Pelican Bay. So I think of this as an interesting story of sociologists call this legal endogeneity. The uh, prison system kind of internalized these legal norms that the courts had imposed in the 60s and 70s and then built prisons to those minimum standards and they became very hard to challenge legally. So it's one thing people often ask about long-term solitary confinement, is it constitutional? Well, most courts have held yes. There have been a couple really local cases recently about people who've spent 40 years or more in these conditions. There was just a case in Pennsylvania of a guy who'd been in isolation for 37 years, I think, and the court there said, that's too long, you have to put him back in the general prison population. The guy's in his 
1960s. He hasn't done anything wrong in years. Um, so there's been a few cases like that, but very little holding that these conditions are by themselves unconstitutional. So that was another surprise. And I think we're getting to my last surprise. You guys, are, you guys all look still awake. This is, this is good. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. So uh, the, the final surprise in studying these institutions, when I was a graduate student at UC Berkeley, I made a data request from the California Department of Corrections to try to get some basics about who was in Pelican Bay. Who are these guys in these 1056 isolation beds? How old are they? What's their race? How long are they there? Why are they there? It turns out, I've kind of hinted at this, we know very little about these facilities. Even still, even though there's more attention to these kinds of conditions, the ACLU did a great report last year about administrative segregation in Texas, trying to get kind of similar data. That has just begun, and we still don't have a good count. People argue about whether there's 20,000 or 100,000 people in these conditions of long-term solitary confinement in the US, or more, uh, because every state calls it something different. Texas administrative segregation, California security housing units. Um, so it's really hard to count from state to state, and states don't have much incentive to track this data. They just get in trouble and get sued, as in, as in California. Um, so as a graduate student, I thought, well, maybe I can make a kind of innocent request, just get some basics from, from the states. And so I asked, you know, how, what's the average length of time people are spending there? What's the racial breakdown? And a lot of the data the state gave me didn't especially surprise me. I had been studying these units for a few years. It turns out that isolation in most states that have looked at it tends to have a really racially disproportionate impact. So we know that people in prison, uh, Latinos and African Americans tend to be overrepresented in prison populations relative to their representation in the general citizenship of the US. Similarly, people tend to be doubly overrepresented again in isolation units. Now, that's not necessarily surprising if you think back to the gang policies I told you about in California. The people getting, the majority of the people getting sent to these long-term isolation units are labeled gang members. And in California, they say, well, we're most worried about uh, Latino gang members, like the Mexican mafia. So of course we have a disproportionate Latino representation in isolation. A lot of states say, well, we're most worried about Black Panthers or Black guerrilla families. So of course we have an overrepresentation of African Americans. But when you look at the numbers, it's, it's striking that states tend to have this you know, doubly racially disproportionate impact. The state also told me that on average, before people got out of isolation, they were spending one to two years in these long-term solitary confinement facilities across California. And that's the people who eventually get out. That's not the 500 who are there indefinitely. Um, but then they gave me this chart, which completely surprised me at the time. This is a chart of all of the people in California released directly from the state's long-term isolation units like Pelican Bay onto parole in the state. And it turns out, I'm sure you can't actually read it, turns out it's around 1,000 a year. It's 100 a month or so, roughly. That's a lot of people going directly from that cell onto the streets of major cities like San Francisco or Los Angeles or Houston or Dallas. Again, it turns out most states that have looked at this over the past few years, there have been similar statistics. It's true in New York. It's true, I understand, from this recent Texas report. Usually, hundreds, if not thousands of people a year come directly out of these isolation units onto the streets. Now, it kind of makes sense because, as I told you, prison officials send prisoners into these units, but they're not affecting their criminal sentence. So if someone gets sent into segregation indefinitely, when their criminal sentence expires, they have to be released, and they just get released directly from those isolation units in a lot of states. This finding is interesting, though, in part it's interesting because it's shocking what we don't know about these facilities, and until you even ask for data, it's hard to know what the right questions are to do the interesting research. And it's interesting because it raises questions about whether these guys are all the worst of the worst that the prison officials claim they are if they're getting released, and we, there have been some horror stories about things that have happened from people released directly from isolation the head of the Colorado prison system who was involved in significant reform efforts of isolation was murdered by someone released directly from isolation in Colorado. But given these numbers, it's amazing that we can only think of one or two stories of these kinds of horrific outcomes. So it's, it raises all kinds of questions about how these units are operating, who's there, the connections between the prison system and the community that, that is relating to the prisoners coming out. Um, in the book, I tell a story of a guy who got sent to isolation who most people agree should have never been there. He was mistakenly labeled a gang member. And he had a nonviolent three-strike sentence, so a life sentence for three nonviolent felonies in California. 
when California changed the law, he was released directly from Pelican Bay. So he's kind of an interesting example of these, you know, how people, the, the many ways people end up here and the, and the lack of oversight of how they end up there and what it's like when they get out. So now that I've um, thoroughly depressed you for, I always try to end <laughs> on a little bit of a happy note, which is to tell you about reforms that are happening in California. And my understanding is there's really interesting reforms happening in Texas now also. And there are across the US, people are just beginning to pay attention to these conditions of confinement and ask questions about whether these kinds of policies make that much sense. Um, it's uh, interesting to, when I started this work, I was particularly, I was interested in the most hidden aspects of prisons. And I thought that if people understood more about solitary confinement, they would be likely to rethink these policies. And a lot of Californians kind of threw up their hands and said, no, this state, everyone's tough on crime. Everyone here supports things like three felonies and you get a life sentence. Everyone supports the death penalty. You're not gonna get anywhere with understanding solitary confinement more. But it turns out that as people have come to understand solitary confinement, they are kind of disturbed by these policies. They have direct social impacts on us. And one of the best examples of that was the hunger strikes in California. Have people heard about this? California-centric, am I being? So, so in 2011 and then later in 2013, thousands of prisoners in California collaborated to protest the conditions of confinement at Pelican Bay in these long-term isolation units. And the story of how this came about is totally fascinating. There were, I showed you, there's those pods of eight. So in order to further isolate prisoners, California had instituted this policy of putting alleged rival gang leaders on those tiny pods of eight. So the idea was, if you're on that pod, you can talk to the seven other guys on the pod. You can shout at them. Sometimes you can throw a note under a kite under the cell door. Sometimes you get a friendly officer who will pass things back and forth. So those guys on, on that single pod have a little bit of communication. But the prison system's idea was, well, if we put rival gang members there, we're further socially isolating them because they're not gonna wanna talk to each other even. But it turned out there was this group of guys, these led rival gangs, who'd been on this pod for a number of years in the California prison system, and they kind of got to be friends over time because they were stuck with each other. And they passed these notes back and forth and came up with this idea of a hunger strike to protest the conditions of confinement. So they put together a list of demands. They mailed it out to prisoners' rights organizations throughout California. Those organizations mailed it back in to other prisoners throughout the system. And in that way, they were able to coordinate this strike. The things they asked for were incredibly basic and simple, and I think it was part of why they got so much attention. So some of the things they asked for in their list of demands, uh, they wanted wool caps when they went out onto those exercise yards, because it's actually really cold on the Northern California coastline. Um, they wanted colored pencils. So after one of the concessions in the strike, you started seeing colored drawings coming out of isolation because they had more access to colored pencils instead of just graphite. Um, they wanted a little more food. They argued that they didn't, the, the prison system gave them less calories because the idea was they were in isolation and they didn't need as much as, as people working jobs. Um, so incredibly basic things they were asking for. And they were able to mobilize in the first strike, thousands of partic prisoners participated. In 2013, 30,000 prisoners across the state refused food, some for almost eight weeks. And so this drew national and international attention to the prison system. The fact that these allegedly most violent gang members in the system were coordinating this completely nonviolent hunger strike. The UN Special Rapporteur on Torture came in, the International Red Cross. There was all this attention to what in the world is going on in California. As part of the strike, the state released this snapshot data for the first time, revealing that there were 500 guys who'd been in isolation for more than 10 years. And that was the first time anyone even realized the scale of the isolation. That group, led by some of the hunger strike leaders was certified as a class and there was litigation about the length of time they had been in isolation and the procedures, these really discretionary procedures by which they were labeled gang members based just on tattoos and what they were reading and who they were hanging out with. Uh, and in the end, uh, the state settled. Uh, they were, you know, as I told you, I don't think the lawsuit had that much hope of being that successful given the most liberal judge in California had held that this institution these prisoners were protesting was constitutional in the 90s, but there was so much public pressure and condemnation of these conditions and so many questions about whether all of these guys were that dangerous. And the cost, cost $90,000 per prisoner per year to keep someone in isolation at Pelican Bay, as opposed to about 40 to 45 to keep someone in the general prison population in California. 
our prison costs are really expensive. <laughs> in a lot of the South, it's more like 20 to 25,000 per person per year. But in general, it costs almost twice as much to keep someone in isolation. So incredibly expensive. You could send three, four people to college in California for that cost. Um, so uh, there, was, there was this public attention. They were also in the litigation able to uh, develop all kinds of interesting social science and hard science evidence about the impacts of long-term solitary confinement. So there's just beginning to be really interesting neuroscience research about how parts of the brain actually shrink when you don't have human contact for extended periods. Um, so all of this evidence comes into the court and the, and the prison system settled. And they agreed about a year ago to get rid of this gang validation policy. Now in California, you have to do a specific thing wrong. You have to violate a specific prison rule in order to get sent to isolation. You can't be sent there simply based on your status. And they capped the terms in isolation at five years. Huge triumph when you're thinking about 10 to 20 years. But it's also still a really long time to be in those isolation units. Um, but they also promised to make this retroactive and to get those 500 guys who'd been in isolation for more than 10 years out of solitary confinement. And as of December, there were only five of those original 500 left at Pelican Bay. The rest had been reintegrated into the general prison population. That hasn't been a perfect process. One of the guys who had been in isolation continuously over the last 40 years in California was Hugo Pinnell, who was accused of trying to help George Jackson escape. So an example of the, the powerful resonance of the George Jackson story that the one guy whose conviction was never fully overturned was in isolation continuously from Jackson, one of the first guys to go up to Pelican Bay. And when he was released back into the general prison population, he was murdered within a few days. And I think it's an interesting example of the challenges of these kinds of reforms because no one has an incentive to protect George Jackson's compatriot, Hugo Pinnell. He's a notorious prisoner in the prison system. The prison gangs win by, rival prison gangs win by the triumph of, of killing this guy. And the prison system wins by not protecting him because they prove that these guys are dangerous and they do need these isolation units that they've been using for so long. That said, that's the only seriously violent story associated with the, the release of these almost 500 guys from isolation into the general prison population. So it has been overall working pretty well for now in the state and it, it's a really interesting story of organizing from within the prison from incredibly restrictive conditions of confinement to get pretty big social change and, and within a legal system that isn't that sympathetic to it as I should suggest it. So I think that's the end and I welcome your questions. I think they have a mic for you. Um, in your research at Pelican Bay, I'm curious if you um, talk to correctional officers who work in solitary confinement and what their, um, I, mean, I, I, I worked on the ACLU report mm -hmm. and we got a lot of feedback that correctional officers in solitary confinement suffer a lot of the same emotional issues um, to having to work in those conditions. So I'm just curious if you had any information. Yes, so uh, that's, a, that's a great question about whether I was able to talk to correctional officers who work in solitary. Over the course of this research, I came to think, and, and it's kind of a subtext of the story, that the prison officials working in these institutions are incredibly important. Not just the guys who designed them, but the people working on the ground, making decisions about who goes there and dealing with prisoners like Von Dorch. I mean, on the one hand, that's a horrible story of abuse. On the other, I can't imagine being a prison officer and having to deal with that kind of mental illness without any mental health resources. Um, and so I think it's an incredibly important part of the story. California has not been particularly excited to let me into their prisons. And, and a lot of the story is about the challenges of trying to figure out anything going on, about anything going on in these units. A lot of the prisoners I interviewed were people who had been released directly from isolation because I couldn't get access to the guys inside outside of writing letters. And the prison system had no interest in letting me talk to any of the staff at Pelican Bay. They told me to stop trying to reach out to them. I was able to talk to some staff who work at the state's other uh, long-term solitary confinement facility, which is Corker, and especially psychologists who also talk about the trauma. But I was so motivated by that that I'm starting a new project in Washington State, which will have a huge component of staff and the effect of working in these institutions on staff. Washington State has been incredibly welcoming. Um, and they are also involved in solitary confinement reform. They've cut their long-term solitary population in half. And so I'm both interested there. I'm gonna, the target is to interview 100 staff who work in their isolation units. 
And it's both to understand the impact of this, which very few people have looked at. I think correctional staff have been completely under, uh, uh, there has been inadequate attention to them in general in, in a lot of this work. Um, but then also to look at how the staff feel about the reforms and what role they're playing in that reform and whether they think it's a good idea or not and, and how that's playing out. So I think it's a really important question. And I'm, maybe someday California will let me in. They don't, they don't love my uh, harsh critiques of, <laughs> of their system, as you can imagine. And they tend to be a pretty closed system. They're not that excited about. I think TDCJ actually has a much better research relationship with a lot of folks than California. But Hello, I'm Odalis. I'm a freshman here at San Houston State. Um, what advice can you give an What advice can you give a college freshman interested in conducting research within the correction system? <laughs> That's a great question. What What advice for people interested in doing research in corrections? Well, one one thing I always tell my students is just go wherever you can get access. Right? I mean, the, in research, the the standard process is well, what's your question? How What's the ideal method to answer that question? In corrections research, I think the the approach is often well, where can you get access? And then we'll figure out a question and a, and a research approach. Um, so, so I think that's always the first. And the second thing I would say is just to keep an open mind. As someone who came at this work with a background in prisoners' rights, I had done, I had worked actually for the law firm in California that does a lot of the prisoners' rights litigation in the state when I started this research. And I really had to overcome that background when I was talking to prison officials about their decisions to build supermaxes. And I think in overcoming that, right, in convincing them and myself that I could be open-minded, I really was able to get a different perspective on the system in terms of their fears and goals and, and the lack of resources that they were grappling with. And so I would say that goes both ways, right? I mean, I feel like it very early days I had to overcome my sense of what I would expect from prisoners I was talking to but I, I think it keeping keeping an open mind in this work and really hearing the challenges people are facing without necessarily judging it or um, assuming they're telling you a story that isn't true is it, it, is important in this work I think hope that helps a little yes uh, right here on the right. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that uh, a lot of the, uh, the offenders in Supermax are released directly onto patrol, uh, parole. Yeah. Is there any data on the rates of recidivism for those offenders? And if they differ across, like, from those released on parole in general pop versus um, admins? Segregation. Yeah, so the question is rates of rates of recidivism for people released directly from isolation. So you you were clearly a good researcher. These were some of my first questions about facilities as expensive as this. One, uh, do they reduce rates of violence in the prison system if that's if they're supposed to make us safer? And two, what happens to people when they get out? There has been almost no research on these questions. I, I mean, I can count on one hand the prison systems that collect the data to even make it possible and the work that's been done. So there's been one rigorous study in Washington State of people released from isolation and their recidivism rates, and, it, and their, the recidivism rates are a little bit higher. They're not astronomically higher. And that's basically the results. That I think there's one other study uh, by, a, by a Mears, who's a cr criminology professor at the University of Florida, and they've, they found mixed results, like nothing dramatic, but probably a little bit of additional. I tried to look at it in California. The data is so aggregated that it's really hard to do anything systematic, but it looks like probably a little bit higher rates of recidivism in California also. Um, so this is something that I think uh, in, in talking about this and in talking about policies, one of the things I say is we absolutely need to be um, making this data, you know, the same way comp stat reports are available or prison population reports are available. We should have the recidivism data and the violence statistics in and out of these units available so that we can do this analysis because these are incredibly expensive public policies. And we need, you know, if this doesn't work, then we need to be thinking about what's next. And it's hard to do that if we're not analyzing the data. So, great question. <laughs> not really. Uh, when the uh, Supreme Court came down a couple years ago and made uh, California reduce some of their, their overcrowding issues, mm -hmm. um, California's uh, outcome was to push a lot of these people into local jails, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. So have any of the policies or procedures that began in CDCR trickled down to the local level, and what kind of issues have you seen through your research that have developed out of that uh, policy change? Great. So the question was about the Plata B. Ra 
Plata v. Brown overcrowding litigation that came out of California, which you might get a much longer answer than you <laughs> wanted. But, but I mean, the history of Plata is really interesting because when I said Madrid kind of spurned the, the case about Pelican Bay and long-term solitary confinement, spurned all of this litigation in California around medical and mental health care that ultimately became this Plata case about overcrowding. So it ties, interestingly, directly back to the Supermax story, where when the judge said you have to have better medical and mental health care, the prison law office, which is this, this independent nonprofit law firm that does prisoners' rights litigation in California, basically expanded that to the states and spent years from the 90s through the early 2000s litigating this question of whether there was adequate health care in the state. And it got so bad that a federal court finally said, I kind of threw up their hands and said, you guys, you can't possibly provide health care to this number of people in prison. You have to let some out or you're just going to keep having unconstitutional health care. So the fact from Plata that really shocked people was that in California there was evidence that one prisoner a week was dying unnecessarily from lack of health care. There were stories about guys dying from abscessed teeth and from lack of dialysis. I mean, stuff that's pretty basic to take care of. Um, and so it makes sense. And at the time, California's prison system, I think, was just a little bit bigger than Texas's. And now we're, we're back down to uh, around 130. So we're, we're no longer the biggest. <laughs> um, so the, the solution that the courts ordered was to reduce the prison population. And they basically, uh, the state negotiated for a long time about how to deal with this. And they passed state legislation that left it up to counties to kind of handle what they wanted to do with the people they were sending into state prison. Really interesting, right, when you think about criminal justice reform. Back to my argument about the importance of the local. One of the problems is that often counties, there's, I think this is true in Texas too, right, huge disparities among the counties and how many people they're sending into the state prison system, but then the counties don't necessarily pay for their choices. So California kind of tried to shift that around and change that. Some counties, unsurprisingly, like San Francisco, did a lot of progressive things with the people they were left with in their counties and developed all these alternatives to incarceration and reentry programs. Some counties, like Los Angeles, are still arguing about trying to build a new jail because it's so overcrowded. But the direct response to your question is that it has created massive problems in the jails across the state. And the prison law office, which brought that litigation, has systematically been suing county jail systems. I think they started with Fresno, which is a Central Valley overcrowded prison system, um, uh, overcrowded jail system that had all the same problems that the state prison system had. Too many people in the facility, complete inability to provide medical care, people having serious health problems as a result. Um, and I, I think the hope is that, that once they've established a few consent decrees or settlements in counties that other counties will follow suit, but it's kind of um, one law professor described this as the many-headed hydra. You know, you shut down the state prison system and then you have, I think California has 55 counties. So yeah, I mean, you would imagine trying to sue each one and there's a different set of challenges in each and they're making different decisions about how to handle these populations. So it's a, it is a real problem and I think it speaks to the fact that people are just beginning to think about jail policy in the U.S. And segregation, of course, is a problem in jails too. As Texas, my understanding is Texas is thinking about uh, solitary confinement reform in jails and part of the result of the Sandra Bland case. Um, so there is, there is this new, new attention to, to looking even more local. Really long answer to it. <laughs> Good question. Ah, in the back. Um, I was just wondering, what does mental health care look like at Pelican Bay? <laughs> uh, what does mental health care look like at Pelican Bay? So after the Madrid litigation, the rule in California, and this is the rule in most states that have looked at this, is that people who have a pre-existing serious mental illness should not be sent to solitary confinement. They should be diverted somewhere else. In California, that means they're diverted into cells where they're often in the cell 22, 23 hours a day, but they at least are uh, required to have a window in the mental health isolation cells and more treatment. So that's, that's one answer. Now, that's been a big part of the litigation about healthcare in the state is that those, even those people in those mental health beds have been, there have been problems with abuse. The state has been um, charged with overusing pepper spray. And in fact, some people have died from being left in the cell after being excessively pepper sprayed in these mental health beds. So they've had all kinds of problems, but the idea is there's supposed to be a special mechanism. But then there's this problem of the fact that people end up in isolation and they haven't, either they didn't have a mental illness or they were never diagnosed and they develop mental problems in isolation, which is incredibly common. 
some people survive isolation incredibly well and with their minds intact, but many people don't. And there, so there's, a, there's controversies about this, but for those people who develop health problems in isolation, they are supposed to have access to mental health care. That looks different ways in different places. A lot of prisoners have described to me that often it's just someone stopping by the cell once a week in front of their cell on that unit I showed you a picture of saying, how are you feeling? And a lot of prisoners don't feel comfortable being honest when there's other people around them who can hear. So that, well, a lack of privacy is one problem. Another problem is that people tend to be medicated if they are having mental health problems and some prisoners don't wanna be medicated. So you know, if you do say you're having a problem, they don't want their suicide rates to be high in isolation. There are huge problems with suicide in isolation and so they medicate prisoners. Then prisoners say they feel like they're being sort of medicated into sleep or uh, lack of consciousness. And a lot of the psychotropic medications they use tend to be pretty old school, so they still use Thorazine, which is, you know, makes people shuffle for, for psychiatric problems in isolation. So it's, a, you know, it's a, so medicines that are known to have pretty severe side effects that people might have. So there's, you know, I think Pelican Bay, at least because of the litigation, people aren't being beaten up there anymore. They're not being set up to fight each other. And I think they more or less get health care, but there are all kinds of problems with preventing it. And that's kind of the best case scenario in these places. You guys have, you guys have been good sports post Super Bowl. <laughs> I should have brought coffee. <laughs> Research has been done mm. on. I don't. I, that's probably yeah. one of the questions I had about all of this. Is okay. They're in solitary, but how? Do, what's the what's the research on how that? Affects what is the psychological effect? So the the research is really interesting, and there's and there's a couple strands of it. One is research largely coming out of the military about the effects, you know, around prisoners of war and what people can stand about the effects of both solitary confinement and sensory deprivation, dating, dating back to the 40s and 50s. And there the research is pretty clear that uh, sensory deprivation, so you know, having the lights all on or the lights all off and no human contact, um, can cause people to hallucinate, to have anxiety attacks, uh, to, to go basically pretty crazy, to be colloquial about it, pretty fast. And people who've participated in these experimental studies have often uh, said after a few hours they, they want out, they can't, they can't stand it. So there's this strand of kind of experimental research, some of it from the military, about uh, the effects of these conditions. Um, and uh, interestingly, a lot of this, you know, some of the early lockdown units in the 70s that preceded supermaxes, so they, sometimes they were called behavioral modification units, or the, um, the federal system was experimenting with some of, some of this. Actually, it was a, partly was a dialogue between military experiments and the prison system saying, oh, interesting, maybe we should try that in prison to control people's behavior. So there is this interesting backstory around that. Then there's another strand of research about the impact on people in isolation, mostly conducted for litigation. So in California, there's a JD PhD psychologist named Craig Haney who's done the, the vast majority of this work. He's one of the experts who anytime there's one of these cases gets hired. And he got his start on this in the Madrid litigation in the early 90s around Pelican Bay, where he systematically interviewed um, I think more than 100 of the guys in isolation at Pelican Bay to look at the effects. And he and another psychologist in, in um, Boston named Terry Coopers developed this idea of shoe syndrome that people, which is the constellation of symptoms that people tend to develop, they have documented again and again in litigation uh, after you know, months in isolation. And that's um, problems with anger management, problems sleeping, the anxiety, so a, a lot of physical symptoms, headaches, heart palpitations. Um, nightmares, so you know, the things you might imagine if you think about being in that cell for extended periods of time. Now that research has been criticized because it's almost entirely been conducted uh, for litigation. So there are people who say, yeah, but you know, they, have a, they have an agenda and they're, and they're documenting it for this very explicit purpose. But it's a hard thing to experiment on. 
Um, and the one study that has been done was a study funded by the National Institute of Justice in Colorado where they tried to systematically match. So they had people who looked very similar in terms of their disciplinary histories and their backgrounds, and they were randomly assigned. Some went into isolation and some didn't go to isolation, and they did pre and post uh, surveys of them, and they found very little mental health deterioration. Now, that study has been criticized <laughs> from every direction. Um, one is that the, the evaluations were self-reports, and there was one young female graduate student who was just administering these surveys to prisoners before and after, and so people said, well, you know, it would be really nice to have someone who's a trained mental health professional evaluating this, and self-reports are complicated, especially if it's the first time these guys are seeing a woman. Um, at the, the most damning thing about the study is that someone actually committed suicide in the, while they were in isolation in the study, which suicide rates in isolation are much higher than suicide rates outside of isolation. And the study dropped the person who committed suicide because they, were, they could no longer be evaluated. Um, so that's, I think that's <laughs> deep criticism of the findings that, that was, they, they couldn't quite grapple with that. Um, but, it, but it is to say, I, th you know, I think we need way more research. And, and one of the things I talk about in the book is that people do survive, right? On the one hand, there is all this research showing that these are these serious consequences. And people I interviewed certainly described shoe syndrome to me. And even out of isolation, they have all kinds of anxiety, loud noises. They're uncomfortable in crowds. They're uncomfortable. You get in that tiny cell, you're able to control everything. And so people talk about how hard it is to go out into the world where you can't control uh, how perfectly your toothpaste tube is uh, t top is screwed on. And they would, you know, they people who survive develop really rigid routines. Like they'll do a thousand push-ups and sit-ups in the morning at 5 a.m. when they get up, and they talk about. You know, years later, they're still waking up at 5 a.m. and doing that because they can't break that routine even out of prison. Um, but they're still, you know, they're, they're, I have talked to lots of people who spent 10, 15 years in isolation who are functioning members of society now. And it, in fact, I was on a panel with a guy who spent a year in isolation in Texas last week in Austin, and he was, you know, you would never know he'd been in prison, let alone in isolation. So people survive, and it's this, it's this challenge of making sense of it that, yes, some people do okay and recover. And some people clearly don't when you look at stuff like the Madrid litigation, and we haven't figured out how to make sense of that and reconcile it. I just have a quick question about the, you mentioned the lights being on 24 hours a day, <clears throat> and, and what's the theory behind that? Is it, is it the prison policy, is that for safety reasons so that the prisoners can't do things in the dark because that seems to be when you talk about mental illness and uh, or sleep deprivation and the things that can you know problematic of not being able to get appropriate sleep not to mention to know what time of day it is uh, you know separate night from day and it seems like a uh, I, I assume it is safety but it seems like a fairly easy one uh, that they could you know turn off you know make uh, you know, turn off the lights at 10 a.m. or I mean 9 yeah. p.m. or whatever it is. But has there been um, arguments or fights about that as far as w why they're not allowing that it, and the benefits of again, yeah. if, if there's if it's safety, w what is it they they can do in the dark? Right. Uh, anyways, I'm just right. curious about when that. they're locked in this concrete bunker and yeah, yeah. No, this is the, so the the question about you know has, have there have there been attempts to get the and and it varies by state um, in terms of the fluorescent lights and whether they're always on and in California now you can I think you can dim them but they're still always on in in the cell. Um, so yes, the argument the argument for all of these institutions is that they're non punitive. If they were punitive, there would have to be a lot more procedural protections before people were placed there. So it's all about safety and security. And that argument has had incre incredible resonance for all aspects of these conditions of confinement. So the argument is they need to be able to see these guys when they do the counts in the middle of the night, and so they leave the lights on. And in fact, there have been challenges at Pelican Bay around how loud it is when they go down and, and do the counts, and that prisoners, you know, that at night it's actually really hard to sleep for all kinds of reasons having to do with the safety and security. It's, it's not just the lights. Um, and so there is this question of can we mitigate the conditions? And I think there's a, there's a challenge, especially around the reform efforts now, in whether to advocate for mitigation or to advocate for drastic change in how these conditions are used or even abolition. And, and I think it's a real tension because this is an obvious one, right? Letting people out for more hours a day 
letting them have human contact with their family, potentially, right? There are many aspects of these conditions that could make a lot of sense and would probably have huge psychological benefits, especially if we're letting these people back out onto the streets eventually. Um, and I think the challenge is just, well, do we, do we fight those things one, you know, piecemeal one condition at a time, or do we think about reforming the whole practice by which people end up here? And, and I guess the one thing I would say is that part of my story is the story of how litigation has perfected these institutions already, and I think that's part of the challenge of the lights, right, is that um, one of the problems with early prisons was they were dark and people couldn't read and they were in these uh, black holes, and now the partly the light thing in particular, I think, hasn't been challenged because it is a response to the fact that these places used to be so dark. And so that's a, that is a secondary challenge of this, is the history of, of litigation and how these institutions are, have responded to it. Hi, um, I guess I just have a question about what you would recommend to help <clears throat> kind of build these researcher practitioner partnerships with correctional institutions. Like, do we just need like MSNBC or an A&E &E to build follows with a film crew? Is that how we're gonna get access or what would you recommend? I know, I do not think MSNBC or 60 Minutes are particularly good ideas. I think California, so I think the reason I couldn't get access in California is because of 60 Minutes, not, to, <laughs> not that I don't think that had value, but, but I really think uh, that the relationships in California, because of both media attention and litigation, are so contentious that these researcher practitioner partnerships are especially hard. Um, but it is so important, right? Um, and I guess one thing I would say is it just takes time. I mean, I, so in Washington State, I've spent two years, this is a state that historically has let researchers in, has great relationships where they have PhD researchers embedded in their Department of Corrections depart, uh, research. They've, um, one of the only other qualitative projects about solitary confinement is Total Confinement by Lorna Rhodes. She's an anthropologist who had years of access in Washington State, so they have a long history. Even so, it's taken me two years of um, a few trips up there to meet with headquarters, to meet with people who work in these institutions, to say, I'm, I really want to understand what your job, right? I am not here to criticize you. I think this is the, this is the battle in corrections is that uh, they feel, especially in states like California, they feel so perpetually criticized and they have no incentive to let us in. And, and I guess one of the things I've learned is to say, you know, I, I think you have really hard jobs too. And I, I genuinely, like, you know, to me, a lot of the things that have gone wrong in these institutions are about not having resources to think about how to do it better. And can we figure out how to begin to be part of that conversation? So I guess I would say patience and <laughs> really, you know, making the point that this is, you know, I think, I think there's a tendency to study the prisoners and their experiences. And, and I think, that it's really important to study the whole institution and, and to bring the people working in them in, into the conversation and to, to really think, and to be sensitive. I mean, the other thing is just, the ch like, you know, as someone who came at this from a kind of prisoner's rights background, I tended to be dismissive of the like, I don't find these prisoners scary, right? I've been doing this work for years. I've taught in prison, I've, I've interviewed, like, I, I'm not, I, I understand that if you have a contentious relationship with these guys in isolation, they might be really scary. But in general, I'm not particularly, you know, I, they, they see me as someone who's coming in to give them a break often, and I, and I think uh, I'm, I'm more likely to be in danger walking down a dark street or driving on the highway than, right? It's not, it's not that none of these people are dangerous, but, um, and so I tend, I think for a long time I tended to be dismissive of that, but I think there is, these facilities are scary, and, they, and there are lots of things that can go wrong, and if they go wrong, and if a researcher like me gets hurt, that's horrible for the system. And so I think the other thing I've learned is just to develop a lot more sensitivity around the fact that even though I might be comfortable in these situations, I think it's really important to respect the, the many challenges of working in these institutions and navigate around that in terms of, you know, ideally I would have, I would do interviews in completely private spaces and no one would be around and the people wouldn't be handcuffed, in, but that's not always gonna work. <laughs> And so sort of figuring out how to, how to have some of these conversations and, and what you're comfortable compromising on. And similarly around data control, right? I mean, this is another challenge of doing this work is I think a lot of prison systems want to have total control over the research coming out and really doing the work to say, well, I, you know, I, if you have control over what I say, then it's not as independent. And then if I say good things, that also is going to be challenged. And right, how can, how, can I, how can I make you comfortable that I need independence in the analysis, but um, have, have you have a say, right? I, I want... I want you to read what I'm writing and, and have a say on it. I just don't want you to control what gets published and what doesn't, which I think is another big challenge. And then there's IRBs, right? I mean, which is a whole other, our prisoners, our prisoners are vulnerable population 
certainly is social science research what was meant to be targeted and how can how can we protect them and how can we get access so there are, there are all these challenges but I think it's you know it's worth it's worth sort of thinking about them systematically because our I think our prisons aren't going to change until more people get this kind of access and work with corrections to think about better policies I do not know of medical experiments happening at Pelican Bay, but uh, medical experimentation in prisons continues to be a really tough problem. And prisoners, I mean, you get, you hear sort of anecdotes about prisoners saying, oh, this, you know, this doctor gave me this experimental drug or this. So I don't know of anything systematic happening at Pelican Bay. Um, and, I, and I think California, I mean, they, they didn't even have doctors up there, let alone people, right? Um, but it turns out, but it turns out that medical experimentation continues to be a challenge to regulate in prisons because, and and to my knowledge, you know, there it happens in Texas, uh, in particular. I've read a few studies here, but I mean, there's a problem of private drug companies and the fact that they're often not even subject to institutional review boards. And then there's the challenge of what counts as as research that's beneficial to prisoners. And I think there's a lot of debates. Now, again, about, well, if prisoners aren't getting adequate health care at all, maybe we should let medical schools in to provide some care, um, and it, that's better than nothing. And uh, my argument is often, well, if there's no care at all, then they can't make a rational, non-coerced decision about whether they can participate in an experiment that might have some dangerous consequences or might involve you know, a placebo and, and no care at all. So this, this is kind of this hidden thing that I think people, you know, once in a while percolates up, maybe we should allow more prisoners in research. And it's a challenge for me, especially because I think more prisoners should be allowed to participate in qualitative non-invasive interviews. I think the history of prisoners as vulnerable populations is about invasive medical research and the problems with that. On the other hand, I think it is, it is tough when we have systems that aren't providing adequate medical care across the US to think about how to, how to do that and whether experimentation can be done safely or not. So, not at Pelican Bay, as far as I know. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for coming to present to us this morning. This was a wonderful presentation. Oh, thank you. I was wondering if you could share with us some of the feedback that you've received about your book from the various stakeholders in California. <laughs> um, Something I was very nervous about. <laughs> so uh, sadly, uh, Carl Larson, who I really profile in the book because he designed Pelican Bay, died about a year before it came out. Um, but he and I were in touch over the course of the work and I published articles and we'd had many arguments about, about the work. And I, and I think he, um, he, he was the one who kept insisting I had to start with the story of George Jackson, interestingly. Um, so I, I, kind of, I, I kind of honor his, his story by, by doing that actually. But, um, so I think that there's, among the like old school guys, right, there's a, there's a sense of like, eh, you're kind of a little too liberal for us, but we see your point, right? So I've had, and it, same in Washington, I've been really worried since I've started work there and a lot of them have read it and been, I, there I think they like to think of themselves as better than California, so they're a little less uncomfortable with it. So there's, so there's this interesting conversation about, um, you know, you're, you're kind of critical of the system and that makes me kind of uncomfortable, but I also see the point. Uh, you know, a lot of guys who help design these institutions are disappointed at how many people have been in isolation for so long and, and are interested in reforms. Um, I haven't had a chance, I've had a few, in various talks I've had a few kind of line officers in audiences that I've been able to engage with, but I haven't heard from anyone um, who works, you know, like, I don't know of anyone who like works at Pelican Bay as a as a guard who's read it. I've had some. I've had a few psychologists read it and say, you know, this this echoes with the challenges of trying to provide mental health care in these facilities. But that's a great. And the prisoners in general, I think, um, that have read it have I've I've gotten very positive feedback. That's another one that I feel anxious about. You know, there was in California in particular where we have a very strong abolitionist community and a very strong sort of. The, the importance of having these movements be prisoner led, as you can imagine from the hunger strikes. I've had some critiques of, you know, do I have a right to bring the prisoners' voices to bear on this story? And, and that's something I'm sensitive to. I mean, it's why I put the, their pictures of the units up and try to bring in their voices and perspectives in various ways. But it is, um, and when possible, I love to have prisoners speak with me about their experiences, but that's also very, I mean, it is very hard for people to talk about their experiences in isolation. I think there's a lot of re-traumatization around that. So there are, there are all these challenges with the stakeholders. So on the one hand, especially the guys, I should say, um, I wanted prisoners to be able to read the book and so I worked with the press for them to do a special paperback print run that would go into prison right away uh, so that, because usually prisoners can't get hardbacks. 
Um, so I have been, you know, I'm now getting the letters from prisoners in Pelican Bay or who were recently in Pelican Bay, and, and that's been some of the most positive feedback, which is heartening. But the book has also been banned by a few states, including Texas. Texas, I got my first letter uh, a couple weeks ago from a prisoner who had tried to get the book, uh, and he, it was, I, I, they did a free print run, basically, and ran an ad in prison legal news, so you, the prisoners just had to write as long as there were some to get it. And the prisoner in Texas, I love this because it just makes my point about George Jackson. The book was banned because there were details in there about how to smuggle a weapon into prison on the page about George Jackson and how his lawyer smuggled the big handgun in in his cassette recorder. And I was like, but the whole point of the story is that it wasn't true. But anyway, <laughs> um, it was <laughs> apparently, so the prisoner said he was going to appeal it, but that's, um, <laughs> there, there is this challenge of, you know, do, they, do the people who are affected even get to read it? And, and I think it is contentious, but conversation is good. <laughs> I'll repeat your question. What about the might translate to some interest in female prisoners? Have you looked at the rates of violence among Jewish Americans and prisoners in the U.S.? So the question was, how does this relate to women prisoners? Which is a great question. Um, and I admittedly focused in almost entirely on men in the book. California has maybe a few dozen p women in long-term isolation like this, as compared to um, up until recently, three to 4,000 men. So the scale in general in states is very different, but I think that the women's experiences certainly deserve attention. Um, the, the one woman I was able to interview as part of my research had spent um, a, a three, two different three-month stints in isolation for organizing in prison around wanting uh, adequate sanitary products for women on her unit. Um, so women certainly end up in isolation. Uh, you know, Orange is the New Black, the Piper Kernan uh, spends a few months in isolation and talks, I mean, f a few days in isolation and talks about it. Um, and it is getting increasing attention. Um, in, in the solitary reform conversation, some of the work is around all the people who clearly shouldn't be there. So there's, you know, the people who've been there in 10 years with no violent acts, but there's also, it turns out, um, pregnant women end up in isolation, transgender prisoners, the mentally ill, and so there's been increasing conversation about the, that that female piece in particular, and trying to protect them from isolation. There just aren't the scale of like big single-use solitary facilities for women, but I think it absolutely happens, and we're just beginning to ask the question and don't like so much else about solitary confinement, don't have good numbers about it. Um, one of the things I often say about thinking about who ends up in solitary is that it, it tends to be the people who don't fit in various ways in the prison system, and so pregnant women and transgender prisoners make an, and the seriously mentally ill make a lot of sense in that way, right? They're the, they're the people that there's like, it's hard for the system to put a box around them and figure out what to do with them, and so they just end up in isolation. And I think understanding that will help us to think about how to get resources and alternatives in place to try to keep that from happening. But that's sort of getting here. Well, thank you very much for coming. Let's give her a round of applause. Thanks for having me.